Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Capron Asia's 13th annual Top 10 FinTech Trends in Asia Pacific webinar, and we're really happy to have you here today. Every time we do this, we, we get more interest from individuals, and we've got several hundred registrations and many attendees for today's session, so really happy to have you here. As with all of our webinars, we're doing this in listen-only mode, but we're happy to take questions from you. So if you have any questions, please do use the functionality in Zoom to, to ask those, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I think when we look back at the past couple of years, we've gone from a new normal to the, the normal normal uh, when we look at the way that the impact of the pandemic has affected the fintech industry across Asia Pacific. You know, when we did this in 2020 and 2021, things were a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty about what the pandemic's impact would be on fintech. Now, the real question is moving from the impact of uh, the pandemic on fintech to what fintech could expect in the future from the impact of the kind of global uncertainty we have around the macro economy and some of the geopolitical issues that we have around Asia. But certainly, uh, when we look at fintech in general, I think it, it, certainly Asia is a bright spot for that. Just briefly, before we get started, if you haven't engaged with Capron Asia before, uh, very briefly, we are a market research and consulting company focused on the financial industry in Asia. From offices in Shanghai and Singapore, we bring you some of the what we see as the key trends across the industry and work with clients to help them find a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, in addition to this top 10 trends report that we do every year, we have a number of other reports that we have on the market. Uh, some of our recent reports are on the screen right now, but you can see and you can download those from free from our website. So please do uh, engage with us. And if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, we'll have information about how to do that at the end. But uh, we'd love to hear from you and and that helps us to provide better content to you, certainly in the future. So when we look at the trends uh, for the financial industry, uh, we've identified 10 as we as we typically do for this, and we'll bring them up on the screen now. We'll go through each one of these. Uh, one of the complaints that we've heard from people listening to this in the past is that we haven't gotten through all of them, even, even in the hour of time that we have. So today we're going to endeavor to get through every single one of these trends. Uh, so that you can hear what our thinking is around all of this. We also will be recording the session and sharing a link to the recording to the individuals. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Joe, I want to come to you. I mean, open banking, that's something that you've been looking at. That's something that's obviously a trend here in Asia Pacific. Can you walk us through the past, present and future of open banking and, and what we're expecting in 2023? Yeah, thank you very much, Lennon. Okay, well, I think it's probably best just to start with a very brief definition. So open banking is the use of application programming interfaces, APIs, to streamline the sharing of customer bank data with third parties. Now, whilst that's the premise for all open banking, there are different flavors of it uh, that we see across Asia Pacific. And these can be largely parceled or bucketed into those that are market-led and those that are regulated. Now, Southeast Asia is, uh, is market-led, and the core driver here has been demand from customers. And so regulators really have been taking quite a light-touch approach and not been mandating uh, banks to implement open banking. And that's in contrast to jurisdictions such as Australia, uh, where there is a, a legal obligation. Now, open banking is the first step towards uh, what we call an open data society, and that's allowing consumers to fully own their data streams. And a stepping stone on that journey is open finance, which is an extension of open banking that allows the exchange of a much broader range of consumer financial data, not just from banks. Now, how is it developing? Well, there are a number of benefits for banks uh, to implement open banking. In an era where time to market is paramount, and these are facing high development costs, um, the architecture of open banking enables them to integrate white labeled, uh, innovative FinTech products. And that helps to provide them with some agility and personalization and to respond quickly to changing expectations as these evolve. The other thing that banks are facing here um, is high costs, both to acquire and to serve customers. So another uh, thing that banks can do with the architecture is leasing their infrastructure and to allow third parties to build offerings on top of their regulated infrastructure. And that provides a number of benefits. It, it provides banks with a larger customer base and it reduces the cost to distribute their products and services. And that's important in a, in a place like Asia, 
uh, with financial inclusion, where 70% of Southeast Asia adult population is either underbanked or unbanked. Um, in addition, millions of Southeast Asia's small and medium-sized enterprises are facing large funding gaps. Um, so uh, cutting these distribution costs allows banks to serve um, uh, these underserved segments. Now, what's next? Um, uh, you know, a number of big banks have been holding out. They're reticent about joining the movement. They're worried about losing their competitive edge and having their profitability eroded. Um, so there is perhaps some uh, uh, talk about um, regulators in Southeast Asia mandating open banking to try and speed up its adoption. The other thing that we would need is uh, we lack unified standards. So I think that's important. Um, two other things that are worth mentioning is, of course, we always hear about legacy. Well, certainly uh, incumbents will need to overcome their legacy challenge. A lot of their uh, uh, core systems are running on COBOL-based mainframes, and it's just not very suitable for open banking. So in this respect, digital banks are quite well positioned. Um, and the other thing that needs to change is mindset, especially in APAC, where banks are really quite wedded to this full-stack branch banking approach. Uh, they need to start to uh, appreciate that they don't have to play a central role in the value chain. They can just be a component part of other people's uh, value chains. That's great. That's great, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for going through that. Um, one question I have on this is, you know, if we were playing fintech buzzword bingo, open banking would be, uh, you know, B1 in terms of overused uh, language over the past, you know, five, maybe even decade. What, what do you think is changing? Is, is, is there anything changing or is this just going to be a constant refrain that's in the background about open banking, open banking, open banking? Um, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, that certainly incumbents do face increased competition. And I think and the other thing that they do face is you know, customer expectations, you know, are changing. There's a lot of pressure on these banks. So, you know, I think, of course, you know, we can say that open banking is a buzzword, but it also has very real implications for banks. So I think more and more of these now are starting to look at their legacy and starting to really appreciate the benefit it could uh, bring to them. Uh, but it is slow. Um, certainly, you know, there are still some concerns. So I think there is definitely space if the regulator to step in. And as I said, um, might need to start thinking about mandating it. Extent. Interesting. Ben, let me bring you into the conversation. I mean, with and we'll be talking about embedded finance a little bit earlier on or a little bit later. But I mean, do you agree with Joe's points on this? Do you think that open banking uh, will have to be mandated in the future for it to work? Yeah, perhaps. I, I think that that's an interesting observation. I, the other thing I, what, that Joe was talking about was the systems and the legacy systems and, and how banks deal with that. Because like you say, uh, many banks have, have very old systems and it's a pain point for, for all operations in, in all banks. So I wonder, Joe, what are you seeing in terms of how are banks um, doing this? Are they completely re-engineering their whole stack or are they bolting on you know, additions for specific products or what are you seeing in, in, in that regard? Yeah, again, thanks, Ben. That's, that's a great question. Um, well, I think the, the reality is that overhauling your whole core, uh, there's, there's, there's quite a large risk to that. It, and it's a long process. Um, uh, and, uh, and very expensive. Um, so I think as a halfway house uh, solution, um, I think building on top of that core uh, to uh, become API enabled is something that a lot, lot of banks are, uh, are looking at. At the same time, um, another option that banks are looking at is um, having a, sort of a new API enabled system in parallel to their old system. Um, and then slowly migrating customers across um, a, a, as and when the technology is proven. Yeah, and I guess like Zanon said, or we'll, we'll talk about digital banks in the few, in, in, in a minute, but I guess that's the sort of thing that digital banks can, can what you're alluding to there is sort of reverse engineering the existing bank by, by the new technology. Yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly digital banks are quite well placed uh, for, for this move. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ben. Uh, now, moving on to trend number two is around fintechs and, and really showcasing the path to profitability f is a focus for fintechs in 2023, I think. And we'll, we'll come to Gavin for this. But one of the things that struck me from the fintech festival and the, the, the growth, international growth markets track that we 
uh, chaired was the fact that uh, you know increasingly VCs are looking at uh, very practical measures. You know, for many years profitability wasn't really a concern for many of these fintechs, and and now all of a sudden it is, and and VCs are looking for more stable and sustainable business models. Gavin, tell us a little bit more about what we should expect in 2023 around this. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Senan. Uh Startups like fintechs, you know, they are, uh, are an essential part of the economy and they're responsible for a lot of the innovation that has emerged and solved various problems in the past few years. Um, they, uh, and as rightfully you pointed out, they've proliferated in the past decade or so because, uh, you know, the past decade has been sort of characterized as, a, as an era of cheap money, especially where venture capital is concerned, uh, injecting funds into companies which needed it, basically, right? Typically in those um, years, uh, venture capital provides most of the funding for these young companies, which um, which then they uh, these, these VCs had a growth at all cost mindset to the extent of sacrificing profitabil profitability, um, which sort of encouraged poor fiscal practices by these uh, young companies in the name of growth, right? Um, players like Shopee come to mind, uh, expanding into Latin America and Europe without having yet shown that it can be profitable in Asia. Um, however, yeah, as, as you pointed out, that is changing. Investors' patients have been dwindling and coupled with a high interest rate environment, uh, fintech companies have been under increasing pressure to show results from their growth and their customer acquisition efforts over the past years, uh, or at least show a clear path that they can achieve profitability. Uh, many startups like these fintechs or platform companies, uh, they are focused on growth and expansion, which is important, but it's also important to remember that business needs to be profitable to survive. Um, and with the economic uncertainty looming and bringing about a changing investment landscape, uh, VC firms are becoming more cautious and selective about where they invest as well as starting to find uh, exit strategies from some of these investments. Um, what this will mean for the future is uh, that startups uh, such as the fintechs will need to be more focused on profitability and sustaining that profitability more importantly, right? Um, and that really means reinventing their business models to focus on their niche markets, uh, markets in which they present a clear proposition. Um, and I think we'll talk about digital banks later, but for example, with digital banks, uh, this could mean having to focus a lot more on what they're um, essentially, um, essentially have more value, which is uh, in, within the underbank sector, right? Uh, for platform companies, it could mean also stalling their ambitions to become a super app and instead, of, and instead concentrate on their core services. Uh, lastly, I think in the next few years could also be a period where more partnerships and acquisitions could occur. I think uh, smaller fintechs may look to form uh, some form of partnerships with among each other um, or with more mature fintech companies, right? Um, and incumbents with a strong capital base may look to acquire some of the smaller fintechs to complement their exist existing services. Yeah, Gavin, um, one thing that struck me when, um, as Zenon mentioned, the, the FinTech Festival, the Singapore FinTech Festival last December, and one thing that really struck me there was there's thousands of, of startups, thousands of FinTechs, and they've all got great business model. I mean, great ideas or, or some sort of business model. And, and like you say, they're, they're re-engineering, you know, with some form of digital banking or some new product or some you know, streamlining, some technology compliance, whatever it is. And... It, it sort of struck me walking around at the fintech festival that you know all of these companies can't survive uh, and they might have great ideas but whether it comes down to the execution of the company you know the, of their of their offering or whether it's uh, you know that simply the market doesn't exist for whatever they're offering um, and it struck me that's really creative destruction in, in action you know the, to, to use a sort of a cliche and I think you touched on it there but maybe we'll see you know in the next in the medium term or in the short term, um, uh, we see in the short term um, sort of a consolidation of a number of these these companies, or, or simply they just go out of business, or, or they get acquired by by someone you know by someone bigger. I don't know what what, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I think I think those are uh, very good observations, and um, yeah, I think 
you know, definitely we've seen uh, a DAF of, uh, of a lot of these small fintech companies popping up, um, especially as you mentioned in, in a fintech festival, you know, thousands of these companies um, here and there. And I think in a large part that has been the, uh, the product of uh, a lot of these venture capital with, um, you know, in a low interest rate environment, um, just really spreading uh, spreading their resources around in the hopes of finding the one good fintech that can um, you know lead to lead to a high return. I think as that funding decreases, that's going to change, and a lot of these companies without a clear value proposition or you know they're not really solving an existing problem uh, will will struggle. Uh, yeah. and definitely will have to exit the market. Yeah. Um, fair, fair point you make yeah. on, on low interest rates. Maybe, maybe that was some, um, maybe that's, that's, that's a large element of it and maybe we're seeing, you know, the, they're coming home, that's coming home to roost now with slightly higher interest rates and, you know, also, you know the, the, like you said, the, 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 the proposition needs to be, to be more concise. Great. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Ben. Uh, the next trend uh, for me is is actually atomic settlement um, and payments for for payments, and and so this is actually my trend. Uh, so let me walk through it, and then happy to open up to the the team for additional thoughts. But you know, fundamentally, when we look at real time payments and and in, indeed cross border real time payments. Um, the introduction of all these new payment systems has has led to near instantaneous paddle, uh, payments, but settlement is awfully, often not real time. So effectively happening later in the day or indeed the next day on some of the even on some of these real time payment systems. So the combination of the development of blockchain technology and you know the next step beyond instantaneous payments is this idea of, of atomic settlement or nearly instantaneous settlement. And so there's been a lot of focus on this, in particular with the idea that blockchain technology being distributed single source of truth could enable these kind of instantaneous settlements on the back end of the payments. And so there's a lot of interest in this in Asia Pacific, in particular, because there's so much focus on central bank digital currencies. Obviously, we have China that has launched their central bank digital currency and, and working through kind of the, the cross-border interconnectivity between the real-time payment systems, both in terms of you know, real-time payment systems like PayNow and, and um, uh, the, the domestic real-time payment systems, as well as interoperability between these, these new systems, like in, in particular the central bank digital currencies. So we've had lots of focus on projects like Ubin, Ubin Plus, Project Dunbar, Project Anthon, uh, I mean, there's been a, a, a large focus on this. So really, when we look forward to 2023, uh, the focus will shift not just from domestic real-time settlement, but cross-border FX as well. And so we have platforms like Party or uh, based here in Singapore that's really focused on this in partnership with Standard Charter, DBS, uh, JP Morgan to enable this cross-border real-time settlement on essentially enabled through blockchain technology. The rise in solutions because of DLT is, is a key part that we're seeing the development in this area. But I think one of the key questions, and, and this was kind of hinted to with Ben and Gavin before, is, is horses for courses and are we really solving a problem that's out there? And I think that's one of the challenges in some of the current solutions that we're seeing is like, okay, what what is the solution that we're trying to solve? When you look at some of the technology platforms that are out there, you know, one of the key challenges in cross-border payments is obviously pre-funding. I mean, there's an incredible amount of money that's tied up in pre-funded accounts and Nostro and Vostro accounts across the world to handle uh, cross-border payments and does the atomic settlement, does that really solve the issues? And, and really, when we look at some of these solutions that are in the market right now, we're not tremendously you know, seeing really good uh, answers to that question. So in general, when we look at 2023, certainly there will be a lot of talk and rhetoric around this cross-border real-time settlement. But the key question remains is, are, are we actually solving any of the issues that are out there? I don't, I don't know. What does the rest of the team think about this? Is this is this really an issue? Uh, you know, do we do we expect to see this? Maybe Josh. I don't know if you have thoughts on this. You cover a lot around cross-border payments. Yeah, I do. 
some of the points you made do resonate quite well with me as well because I, I feel that in order for it to be more widely, you know, um, to, for its usage to be more widespread, you're going to have more use cases um, aside from some of the more niche areas. So I think from what I've seen so far, it's mainly uh, we've, we've heard of some of these crypto exchanges that are trying to use um, atomic settlements. So more of these, I would say, cutting edge uh, types of you know, crypto or other fintechs. But I don't really see some of the more uh, traditional players like a bank uh, using it. So I was just wondering, do you think that uh, what, would, what would it take for it to become more widespread and for some of these companies to be successful? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and 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 again, it comes down to you know wh what are we trying to solve, and what's the correct tool to do that? You know, because it, it, and largely DLT and blockchain, in my opinion, it's it's a great distributed database, but could we do it with the distributed database? And the, the models that we're seeing right now are the idea of kind of a, a gateway bank or a bank sitting in the middle uh, that is providing the the account servicing to the other players. Uh, in the market. So if you look at, at part two, as an example, you know, JP Morgan sits in the middle of those US dollar transactions. So all of these organizations still have to have a US dollar account with JP Morgan, and they're just able to settle it all directly themselves. And, and in that model, and I'd love to hear more about this if, if anybody is on and has, has more insight into this, but you know, you still need to have pre-funded accounts in that case. So is it is it really solving the issue? So I think it's a great question, Josh. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's uh, there's an easy answer for it, but hopefully, I, I, I mean, these companies would certainly hope that there would be on that. Great. Uh, moving along, uh, you know, one of the other topics that was big for us over the course of uh, 2022 and, and is already shaping up to be in 2023 is digi uh, digital asset tokenization. Um, and Ben, I mean, you, you, you've spent quite a bit of time on this for the paper that we did with Chintai towards the middle of last year. Maybe you can walk us through uh, what we should expect in capital markets with uh, digital asset tokenization in 2023. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Anand. Uh, digital asset tokenization, like you say, uh, whether you like it or not, or whether you believe in it or not, the reality is I think that it's we're seeing more and more uh, entrance to the market. Um, you, you mentioned Chintai um, and, and also ADDX, uh, basically a competitor. These companies are offering uh, digital asset tokenization platforms. Um, also, banks are starting to OCBC, HSBC, um, and um, and the exchanges, Singapore Stock Exchange, SGX. They're, they're offering, starting to offer some some products. And let's be clear when we talk about digital asset tokenization, we're not talking about uh, crypto. We're talking about taking an asset uh, and fractionalizing the ownership of that asset on a blockchain. So it's effectively like taking a company and creating a, a whole bunch of shares. Um, uh, but it's done on a blockchain, so that asset might be a security like a company or, or a bond, or it might be uh, uh, something as esoteric as, as a, a painting, a rare painting or, or a vintage wine. Um, and um, uh, so at the moment, we're seeing a lot of uh, platforms being built. I guess then and alluded to it in, in the previous topic, you know, do we need a? Uh, do we really need a blockchain to do this? Because you could arguably do it using a, some sort of distributed Oracle database just as well. Um, so this is, these are sort of the questions um, that are still out there, and the jury is kind of still out as to um, uh, the adoption of, of, of this and, and whether the benefits uh, are really inherent in the product in the in these products. Um, whether whether the streamline it really does streamline the uh, the operating model, you know, capital markets. Does it really make it cheaper? Does it really make things? Um, uh, does it really make it easier for for assets to to be taken to market? You know, questions like that. So, maybe Joe, what what are your thoughts, Joe? I know we, we spent like Zanin said, we spent a bit of time with with on this during the year, but why? Where, where do you see this going? Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so. You know, you mentioned jury's still out there on adoption, and when, when we think about the, the benefits of tokenization, uh, I mean, I mean, certainly it, it sounds, sounds intriguing um, in terms of democratizing the market. But reality on the ground probably is that it's still pretty nascent, and we're not really seeing, you know, widespread uptake. So my question is, what do you think we would need to see in order to see more widespread adoption? Yeah. 
Thanks, Joe. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And and really, I mean, it, it's a case of supply and demand. So uh, very simply, um, because like you say, uh, what do we need to adopt it? It's a great product or it sounds great and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, supply and demand. So, you know, does it really add, does it really give benefit? And and do people really believe believe in the uh, you know in the assets that they're buying? Because for example, if if an asset is pristine value today, then probably it would be listed already with SGX. So what's the point? Then why do I need a why do I need to tokenize it via some secondary platform? So if there's no trust in that asset, then that no one's going to adopt the market. Then no one's going to adopt tokenization. But if if it can be proven over time that yes this is more a more efficient way to get get things to market then then great um i mean i guess on a similar vein you can reduce this, the the ticket size so instead of having to buy a hundred thousand dollar lot for some security offering you know we can bring that to five thousand or ten thousand dollars but again uh you know is there demand for that because it, it takes a lot of people buying a five thousand dollar ticket to make up for one person buying a two hundred thousand dollar ticket, so these sort of these are the sort of things you know uh, um, that that need to be played out. And then again, with that fight with those smaller ticket, uh, the smaller ticket sizes, perhaps the regulator says, well, these are too risky for retail investors who are more likely to have the the five thousand dollar ticket. So so then you're if you're only targeting high net worth investors or accredited investors in Singapore, well then you know maybe maybe it doesn't work. So these are sort of the issues I think that that we need to work through, or that the industry needs to work through, to to, to work out whether this whether this thing has has legs or not. Right. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think you know, digit, 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 digitizing assets will will be something that will come up a lot during the the, the rest of this year as well. I think mean, we've already had some interest from clients and in looking into this in more depth and detail. And I think even just today there was an announcement from Adex around some of the progress that they've made in the market. So it remains a really interesting space. Another interesting space that we've been covering a lot over the past year is digital banks. And, and this is one of the more popular topics for us. Anytime we publish anything around digital banks, either on LinkedIn or in our reports, it always gets a lot of uptake. Um, Josh, you were at the Singapore FinTech Festival. You sat in on the uh, digital bank uh, closed door session that Elevendi held, the expert session. What are your thoughts on digital banks? I mean, maybe walk us through where we are and where we're going in the future. So I think one thing that, that really struck me about uh, when looking at the digital bank landscape across Asia is that there's clear, clearly a distinction between what we call you know, start from scratch types of digital banks um, as opposed to those that are formed out of sort of a partnership um, between, let's say, a more developed, um, a more established bank and maybe a, a, some other organization uh, entity. An example would be the partnership between Trust Bank, uh, the formation of Trust Bank, uh, of the partnership between Fair Price and Standard Chartered, as opposed to sort of a built from scratch bank such as like Revolut or um, in, in, I think the examples in the US would be like a Monzo, for example. Um, so I think the, having a distinction between those two different types of digital banks can help us a lot in understanding their mindset, their strategy, and what they, what options will work best for them. Um, and I think in terms of um, these a lot of these banks are facing the challenge now of uh, the path to profitability, and for many of them, they have found that you know payments doesn't really help them to meet those goals, and turning to lending instead um, seems to be the best option. And I think that's especially applicable in the the Southeast Asia region, where um, there's a lot of um, a huge number of MSMEs which require financing, you know, whether it be micro loans or working capital loans. And that's where a lot of these digital banks have started to try to launch uh, products and um, that can try to tap into this this market um, to try and facilitate you know this the aspects of financial inclusion here as well um, to 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 show that they they are able to bring value and through their lending activities turn a profit as well. Those are really good points, Josh. Thanks for thanks for going through that. I, 
I mean, we, we've, I was talking with somebody about this last week, and, and we've kind of fallen for the digital bank narrative as well. I mean, we interviewed one of the CEOs from the, uh, one of the failed Australian banks last year, and it sounded like everything was going well, and then a few months later, it, it, it collapsed. Um, so, I, I, you know, I guess two questions. The, the first question is, how do, how do we separate fact from fiction in the narrative that these banks are telling? Because one of the things that strikes me is, you know, we, we saw some of the results from Trust Bank. They, they had their final year's results and they talked about how much rice they gave away and how much people were using them on travel. But there wasn't a lot of talk about like any of those traditional metrics like ROE or ROA that we would expect yeah. from banks uh, when they're talking. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about how to separate fact from fiction. And then I guess the, the other question I would have is who's going to who's going to remain standing in this? You know, when we when we look at this, one of the things that strikes me is Australia was heavily VC led. So obviously, you know, VCs have a limited pocketbook in terms of how much they're willing to invest before they just throw in the towel, which seems to have happened. But then Hong Kong's banks almost seem to have an unlimited funding because they're they're dealing with the oligarchs of Hong Kong or the you know deep pocketed Chinese tech firms. So who's going to remain standing in the in the front of this? So maybe fact from fiction and then who, who's going to remain standing would be my my two questions for this. I think that that's the big thing when trying to understand these banks because all the typical metrics and ratios don't apply anymore. So I think you have to look at it more similar to the way you would look at a startup, um, almost as a valuing uh, a startup. So you, I would say that I would look at uh, who are their customers, what's their, their TAM, for example, um, how many, you know, who, who was, who's their addressable market, how large it is. And I think that that is probably a, a telling indicator. And um, for example, in a com company like um, Time Time Bank or um, um, yeah, Time Bank, for example, or uh, it's Philippines, there's, uh, I don't remember the name of that bank now, but um, yeah, so those those banks would be examples of uh, having a huge market of underserved um, MSMEs, and I think that would be one, you know, one plus point for it, for them, for example. Um, and the next thing would be to look at the business model and the types of products they have. So you, you would want to look for products that can actually be uh, profitable in, in the in the larger scheme because if it's if it's only focused on um, certain types of products that would have a, a high cost associated with them for example with payments I think that could be um, dangerous for for this fintech and I think for example um, the digital banks that have lending built in and are able to control the cost around that I think would would be another bonus. And when it comes to cost levers, then this would be a lot um, related to the technology that they have behind it. And I think that's that's some that's an area which would be harder to uh, um, to analyze as an outside investor. But I think looking at, um, for example, the technology vendors that they have would be one way to get a better sense of how they're managing the technology cost uh, related to that. Um, in terms of who's going to remain standing, I think that's. Uh, that's a question that everyone is trying to figure out and i would say that when it comes to the build from scratch um, types of the digital banks i'm a lot less optimistic um, just because of the way that um, they're going to have to compete against established banks and as i mentioned those uh, digital banks from from partnerships between you know deep pocketed institutions such as uh, fair price or um, you know the standard charter partnership so i would say my i would put my money on uh, these sort of partnership JV banks, um, as as they have the deep pockets, the capital funding to uh, to go to go further. When it comes to the start from scratch banks, I'll be highly highly selective and make sure I really understand what's happening behind the scenes in terms of um, the, the operating costs and how they're managing the different costs and revenue levers uh, before I um, I decide to pursue the opportunity further. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, Josh. The thing that's amazing about the comments that you made are, is they're 100% they're sensible comments that anybody would use when they were looking at an investment, but so few people to have over the past couple of years with digital banks. You know, it seems like the it, like in many of these things, you know, the, the, the basics of doing business are kind of thrown out the window in, in this, as, as uh, Gavin had indicated before. I mean, one of the one of the comments that was very resonant uh, from me from um, the fintech festival was in in a, 
a time of low interest rates, all manner of sins are committed. And, and I think that's really uh, indicative of this. I mean, certainly one area where many sins were committed and are still being dug out is the crypto space, and in particular around FTX. And uh, Joe, I want to come to you on this. I mean, I, I guess you weren't too disappointed with you know losing a tremendous amount of funds on in FTX because you had already lost all of your funds on a digital monkey that's now uh, <laughs> kind of worthless in this space. But maybe you can talk a little bit about our, our, the next trend that we have, which is around FTX's implosion and kind of what the implications are for crypto in Asia. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Evan. Um, okay, well, look, I think, again, it's good to start with a bit of context just to look about what's happened. Um, and then we can look at the future going forwards. Um, so look, post-08 uh, and then the pandemic, we were living through this era of you know, very loose monetary policy and quantitative easing. The market was pumped with liquidity, and that liquidity was finding its way into risky assets, and that includes cryptocurrencies. Um, so Bitcoin, I think, peaked at around 69,000 um, in November 2021. Um, there was a flurry of interest from retail institutions, governments, El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, there were a load of institutions that emerged, uh, companies, hedge funds like Three Arrows, um, uh, lending platforms like Celsius. And, and we, really, we were in the midst of a mania. Celsius was offering like 20% returns on deposits, totally unsustainable. Um, and so what happened? I mean, the inevitable, really, there was a, there was a market crash, um, a number of high market, uh, sorry, high profile market failures. Um, basically, we had the collapse of stablecoin, uh, Terra and sister token Luna, both tokens of the Terra Luna blockchain. That sparked a massive contagion. Uh, there was sell-off in cryptocurrencies. We had a crypto run. Uh, people were pulling their coins from exchanges, uh, from the hedge funds, from uh, the platforms. Um, and just when we thought the situation was stabilizing, we had a big sell-off in FTT. That's a token issued by FTX um, after a report by CoinDesk highlighting the potential leverage and solvency concerns involving FTX affiliated trading firm Alameda Research. And then just a few days later, the exchange collapsed. That was November of last year. Um, so where are we now and what's happening? Um, well, we've had a slashing of market capitalization. Um, the crypto uh, market was valued around 2.2 trillion. It's now worth around 830 billion. Um, now, in Asia specifically, regulators uh, were mixed in their uh, approach towards crypto. I mean, you had places like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, that were positioning themselves as crypto hubs. Um, you had places like India and China that were a little bit more skeptical. Um, so what we are now seeing is that, uh, you know, I think certainly if you look at Singapore, uh, we're seeing a distancing uh, now, um, and Singapore saying, uh, Ravi Manon, in fact, said at the Singapore Fist FinTech Festival that Singapore wants to be a crypto assets hub, but not one that centers on trading and speculating of cryptocurrencies. Um, and as I say, Chinese and Indian regulators, um, there, was, there was for a long while a degree of skepticism. I mean, India has a 30% tax on income from digital assets. China's banned cryptocurrency transactions altogether. So I think now, after all of this, um, I think those regulators that had imposed strict regulations like India and China, they're going to be vindicated by all of this. So I think we'll see definitely um, uh, an excuse by them to have um, stricter, harder regulations. And I think for those regulators in the region that were slightly more pro or maybe on the fence, I think that is now going to push them towards, again, taking a harder start. So overall, we're certainly going to expect to see a lot more regulatory oversight um, of the sector and it will be put on a tighter leash. And then in addition, I think it also gives uh, or substantiates um, uh, the use of uh, CBDCs, I think, now backed by central banks. So I think that's something that we'll see more rhetoric around. Um, so it is certainly important for the region. I mean, uh, Asia was one of the most avid crypto kind of, well, a lot of crypto investors, both institutional and retail, they're going to be now cautious. Regulators are going to be on guard. Um, and so ultimately, really, these scandals have put the sector back many years. Um, but having said all that, I mean, look, we still need faster, cheaper, and more e efficient financial intermediation. Um, and perhaps, you know, the underlying technology can do that. 
Um, and interestingly, I'd like to just end by saying evangelists would argue that FTX was fallible because it was centralized. It was a human mediated entity that was operating on top of a blockchain. They would say that if we had real decentralization, um, it would not be susceptible to, to corruption uh, because they would be governed by the self-executing smart contracts um, that would be guaranteed to function as written. So in other words, you know, they would say we need more decentralization, not less of it, to avoid another such, such scandal. Yep, great, great observations, Joe. Um, I think I just have one question. Um, you know, with the fall of FTX, right? We've seen, uh, we've seen a, we've seen a response from various cryptos like Ethereum and Bitcoin. They've went down a little bit, but they've sort of remained resilient. Um, you know, and now even I think pushing back up. You know, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Is the future for for these uh, for 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 these crypto coins? And do you think these exchanges will continue to pop up, or will will some other variation you utilizing these crypto tokens um, will continue pr to proliferate? And will you know um, institutional investors, retail investors, have the same amount of confidence in these uh, in these new technologies and or coins? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Gavin. Um, well, look, uh, first of all, I'd say, look, I think it's going to take a very, very long time for confidence to return. Um, I would also say that, uh, I mean, look, there's always going to be a market for these sort of coins. And so, you know, you know they're going to have some price at some level. Um, but what I, my argument would be, I think, you know, w where we were in this sort of mania, um, you know, and it had become very mainstream. Everyone was talking about cryptocurrencies and every man and his dog were getting into it. I think what we'll see is we'll see a pullback now from you know, institutional investors, perhaps less retail investors getting involved. Um, and as I said, we'll see a hardening of governments, of regulators to regulating the sector. And I think, and, and you know, there's no bad thing, thing necessarily. We'll see the light maybe moving to focus, you know, Singapore is trying to do more on what can the underlying technology do and looking at the benefits there and enabling those. And whilst at the same time trying to avoid this sort of, you know, speculative uh, frenzy that we've just come, come out of. That's really good. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I mean, Joe kind of hinted at it. Uh, our next trend, which is, which is also mine, is uh, central bank digital currencies in Asia. And I think uh, certainly when we look at central bank digital currencies in general, a Asia is really at the, the, the center of a lot of this, with China being the ECNY. And that is our next trend, is around the, the future of CBDCs in Asia. Uh, really, I mean, when we look at where we are today, as I mentioned, China launched the ECNY in early 2020 and, and really launched it formally at the beginning of 2022 uh, in collaboration or in, in timing with the Beijing Olympics. Um, my wife was actually in Beijing during that time and tested out the the prepaid card that could be used for ECNY transactions. And we also have a a video that Lele did a little while ago about actually using the ECNY in practice, which is quite interesting. Um, apparently, approximately 90% of central banks around the world are looking at CBDCs in some form. Um, most notably is obviously China that has already launched one, but then uh, Europe as the uh, digital euro project that's currently ongoing that could be one of the, the new ones that are coming out. And it's really interesting the dichotomy between these different markets because China you know, it's it's very clearly state led, and and uh, that has been great from the carrot and the stick perspective. It's more of a stick perspective than a carrot. And then in Europe, obviously, with questions around GDPR and how digital currency be handling and that, it's a, it's a different set of criteria and factors that they've had to look at. Certainly, around you know when we look at recent uh, proliferation around these issues that some of that Joe hinted at around the issues in the crypto space has made governments kind of readdress their uh, approach to uh, central bank digital currencies and how they're going forward. And and it, it could be argued that the failure of some of these platforms will push central bank digital currencies and governments to look at this more. 
but uh, realistically, you know, the crypto situation has has brought a lot of this idea of digital money to the forefront and, and raised a lot of questions from the individuals that will be actually be using this. So it'll be interesting to see how the uptake of this goes on. The the other question is, you know, obviously what happened in Ottawa uh, last year with the truckers. If you're not aware, it's a really interesting scenario where certain numbers of those truckers, their their bank accounts were frozen by the government. And so that brings into question is the government have our our interest at the at the forefront. And I think that in certain places like Canada will really push back on individuals interest in using digital payment options and in particular around central bank digital currencies. Uh, You know, when we look forward to this, obviously, Asia will remain at the center of this discussion, not just because of what's happening with the ECNY, but in, in terms of what's happening on cross, cross-border integration between these platforms has been a big focus for the BIS in Asia. Uh, certainly, there's questions around the ECNY, around how it will be used cross-border. I think, you know, when we look domestically, it's already very clear the use case there and as, as Lele had done in her video she kind of showed how it's being used on a day-to-day basis with QR codes not entirely different than Alipay or WeChat Pay for that matter but really how it's going to be used in the cross-border use case will be really interesting around that so we're really looking forward to covering this uh, over the course of the next year we've got a lot of projects around CBDCs with a number of clients in particular workshops around this but it'll be really interesting to see how this how this kind of develops in the future um ben I don't, I don't know if you have thoughts around this or questions around this yeah i mean i, I guess my my observation is that i i see on the, the in america more than in asia there's a, a lot of noise some noise from u.s congress about privacy and you know if you if you have my digital if you if we have a digital currency you know what i'm doing and all of this sort of stuff i mean you don't, clearly we don't have that problem in china with the ecny um, and maybe this is just noisy American politicians getting some airtime. I'm not sure. Um, it, it could be a combination of both. Um, and like you say, when Lele was doing her uh, her video um, on on how it's used, it's kind of not that different from from WePay, from from WeChat or, or Alipay or something. So, so who cares you know, if it makes uh, if it has some benefits of economic policy or, or whatever then happy days so I, I don't know do we see that sort of um do we see those sort of issues in in asia or probably less so than, than the states I, I don't know i mean maybe and yeah yeah and you know my personal opinion on central bank digital currencies is that they you know digital payments are already really good you know we have pay now here in singapore Cross-border payments, you know, using Revolut or TransferWise is very cheap, at least on the retail side. So the real question is, you know, why are we doing central bank digital currencies? And and really, it has to be a government play, right? It's the government that wants more visibility and control over what we can do with that. And and we'll be addressing, we've got a, a, a webinar coming up with uh, Finastra in February or March, looking at programmability in, in, in these currencies. And I think that's, it's a good point that you bring up, Ben, is like the privacy aspect of this. This, you know, it's not something that the populace have asked for in many of these jurisdictions, but it's something that the government is is giving them whether they want it or not. And even though when we look at like the digital euro, there there will be a lot of privacy controls that are already put in place. It begs the question, OK, well, well if we have all these privacy controls in place and, you know, zero knowledge proofs or whatever needs to happen to erase this data, like why are we doing it in the first place? And I think that remains a question that that really needs to be answered, but is not being answered. You know, it's not something that governments are really looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like you said, if, as you say, digital payments, prompt pay or pay now, it works, works well, right? It's instantaneous and all the rest of it. So mm. the bank knows, the bank knows what I'm doing. So why do I care if, uh, you know, why would I care? But then why do we need a digital currency if, if those things work? So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, I mean, this is something that you've been looking at as well. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask you a quick question. Yeah. I mean, we look at say, instant uh, cross-border payments, uh, real-time payments. I mean, I mean, I know we've been talking a lot about uh, some regional integration. We haven't really seen um, regional initiatives. We've seen a lot of bilateral initiatives, not really any sort of listed regional initiatives. Do you think that CBDCs could push this forward? And then the other thing there would be, what about like something that we could solve? 
Yeah, I, I think that that idea of uh, interoperability is really key. And, and here in Asia, I mean, you, you saw that from the, the discussion at the Singapore FinTech Festival. There's a lot of talk, but there is not a lot of actual action around cross-border real-time payments. And that's in, in, in Southeast Asia anyways. And Southeast Asia is probably the most natural place for this to happen. So, you know, I think when we look at... Uh, the interoperability on the, the central bank digital currencies, I think really it's going to come from a third party organization. I mean, interoperability was a huge topic for SWIFT at Cybos um, late last year. And I think that will continue, right? The, the, the focus on interoperability and, and it needs to come from a third party. I don't, I don't think on, on the cross-border real-time payment side here in Southeast Asia, I think we'll largely see that continue to be a bilateral discussion rather than a multilateral discussion. But uh, certainly on the central bank digital currency side, that's going to have to come from um, some third-party organization, whether that be a, a SWIFT or an ASEAN or otherwise. Great. Thanks both. Um, Gavin, I want to come back to you, you know, when we look at our, our fintech buzzword bingo for uh, 2023, B2 would have to be embedded finance. But there are some realities around that. Um, you want to walk us through kind of where we are and where we're going on embedded finance? Sure. Thanks, Anand. Well, embedded finance is sort of like a branch from our first trend on open banking, uh, which, you know, as, as Joe rightly pointed out, it's really emerging trend in the financial services industry where financial services are integrated into the products and services of non-financial companies, right? These were mainly driven by changes in consumer behavior and technology. Uh, today, the poster child of embedded finance takes the form of uh, buy now, pay later. I think many of us have heard of this um, in e-commerce and retail payments services such as uh, Grab, pay later, come to mind. Uh, Tokopedia is another example also offers lending to its merchants using its platform. Uh, but companies are also using embedded finance to offer their customers a more seamless and convenient way to manage their finances while using their products or services largely enabled by open banking, right? Bukala Park, you know, an Indonesian e-commerce platform has partnered with um, SE Ventures to allow users on Bukalapak to um, access a full service bank account, uh, which which SC Ventures provides via white label. And, it, you know, obviously it's that that's equivalent to, a, to that offered by a tra traditional bank without without the need for usual banking infrastructure. Uh, well, it is currently the simpler products such as payments, you know, FX, retail lending that predominate the embedded finance space in Asia today. Um, I think for the future, the potential for this is is quite unlimited, right? Um, I mean, obviously, the next steps, uh, taking baby steps, the evolution would be for more companies to further embed uh, the more mainstream financial services, such as savings accounts, like what Bukalapag is doing, but on a more uh, you know regional scale. Um, you know, you can see more companies within the region trying to mimic that. Um, and also building on those savings accounts to introduce um, investment products into their non-financial applications. Right? Lastly, and also more interesting, I think, is that there's the potential for embedded finance to cross over into other industries such as, you know, insurance, healthcare, um, energy sector, so on and so forth. So, so I think really embedded finance has really, you know, cross border, cross industry cutting implications, and you know, uh, the, the potential is great there. Hey, Gavin, I think you, you, you sort of talked about what well, you did talk about it there when you said uh, buy now, pay later is the, the, the poster child for uh, for embedded finance. And I think there's a question mark on the success of that and the, the blow ups of the um, of the buy now, pay later players in Australia is is, um, is a good example where that. that largely forgotten about lending um, regular lending practices and just lend as much as they can um, with a, with a funky platform um, but the reality is that kind of <clears throat> payments and buy now pay later and, and insurance are, is really the reality of where we are today but I wonder um, you know we admit that the market hasn't really captured um, the the sort of the, the SME space and okay you, you mentioned Tokopedia that's that's a good example and, and Bukula Park less so but um, the Tokopedia lending for sure is an example but I wonder if 
you know, how long it's going to take before we see some real traction and see, you know, some super innovative products like treasury as a service or, or places where you can maybe get something like on an accounting software, you, you know, when you're doing your, your regular accounting and then you can make payments and transfer funds or do investment products, you know, from your internal operating, from a company's internal operating software rather than having to log on to a bank account. I mean, those sorts of things I think are more game changing, but I mean, I don't know, do we, do we see these sort of things in the marketplace or, or are these just a pipe dream? Well, yeah, I mean, good, good observations. I think, yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, certainly now uh, where, you know, banks, um, banks have the capability and there's a technology present to sort of open their infrastructure, such as a banking as a service. I mean, IC Ventures um, and Bukalapa, you know, th that's sort of, that's sort of heading in that direction where we can see more services offered by banks uh, on, on these platforms. Um, but, but I think really, really the question is, um, you know, what sort of regulations will be needed to sort of drive this? And, um, you know, I, I don't see banks uh, having that much motivation to sort of enable uh, other platform companies to uh, sort of uh, share, share their pie, so to speak. Um, uh, one 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 segment where you mentioned is the um, you know MSMEs. I, I think that 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 really that really has the potential for uh, as as next steps because I think these these are companies where banks typically find it hard to to lend because of their current um, because of current regulations around you know how much they can lend to to these um, smaller companies and as well as the sort of like collateral that they need from from these uh, smaller companies, which uh, typically they don't have. And so I think that that's where the problem lies and that's where, um, you know, embedded finance uh, can can take the step uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the near future. Yeah. I think one thing you mentioned there was about banks being reluctant to take, take the step and because they're worried that someone's going to eat their pie, right? And this is, I mean, this is the million dollar question. Joe and I did, did some work on, uh, on embedded finance or, or a fair bit of work uh, in, the, in Q3 and Q4. And this was, to me, is, is the, again, the million dollar question where, okay, you know, can we grow the pie and make these solutions? And if you don't, if, if the banks don't do it, and if the banks don't uh, sort of cannibalize their, their existing offerings, then someone will, will eat their, you know, someone will come and take their lunch, um, to use some cliches. And I think that that dynamic, because, you know, the flips, what you've described is, is the classic bear case of someone coming in and knowing your customer and taking taking your customer away. The the flip side of that is that you can onboard customers much more cheaply, much more easily. Um, you can service, like particularly in developing Philippines or developing Indonesia, where the ticket sizes are smaller. You can do much uh, much more efficient business. So that's uh, that's the the bull case, I suppose. But I mean, what you've described, I think, is is, is the classic dilemma for me at the moment. Really, really good points. Thanks. Thanks, Gavin and Ben. Um, I, I think, you know, embedded finance is, is one of those areas where there was a bit of buzzword bingo, but uh, clearly with buy now, pay later, it is a it is a use case that's being used quite a bit. And so I, I think certainly that that will be interesting going forward. Um, one of the other buzzword bingo spaces is is ESG. And Josh, I want to come to you. I mean, you've been looking a bit at this, um, both for this report and for some of the other projects that we're looking at. Maybe you can walk us through kind of the, the current state of ESG right now uh, in the market and, and what you see happening in the future. So I think some of the challenges right now when it comes to ESG, it's mainly around data, first of all, and then turning the data into insights. So when it comes to data, it's mainly the challenges around the availability, the credibility, as well as the comparability of the data. So first of all, it's, um, this, such data is not always that readily available. And many times it's hard to, to be able to trust it to the extent that you wish that you could. Um, and finally, even after you have data that you can trust, oftentimes it's hard to compare it across companies or across countries. So those are challenges that, you know, um, mainly a lot of different frameworks have come up to try and address that. But then you, you also have the challenges of um, different frameworks, putting emphasis on different 
uh, aspects of ESG or measuring it in different ways. So there are a lot of challenges around that. And then um, the next step after you have data that can be compared is you know, what do you do with it as a company? How do you generate insights out of it? So uh, things like climate risk modeling, for example, trying to, uh, to make that data in, turn into something that you can take action on or build a strategy upon. And I think the, the interesting thing or interesting development that we observe is that there are some fintechs, there are um, uh, fintech startups that are trying to address some of these challenges, for example, by building automated systems that would uh, help to, to smoothen or uh, streamline the ESG data collection process, as well as having their own built-in verifications or credibility checks to just sort of um, you know, build, have greater ease of mind on uh, that the data is credible and also trying to, to um, build in features that are updated to the different frameworks to give uh, the user of that platform you know, a better sense of how, uh, how the ESG data fits in and how it's viewed by different frameworks. So I, I think what, what could be interesting is that a lot of these uh, fintech startups that focus on ESG May, may find themselves becoming, I would, I would say, even venture to say that possibly acquisition targets, for example, of a large, uh, larger bank that's looking to adopt some of these technologies. So, you know, since the, the fintech startup has already built it, it's very possible that a larger bank could just, you know, absorb that in um, if that technology is truly something that could add value to them and help to streamline their whole internal ESG process. So that's something that I would not be too surprised to see in the near future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Josh. Um, Josh, I, I have a, just a, a quick question here, which is, you know, obviously, you know, ESG has been in the limelight and we, we hear a lot about you know, climate and uh, social issues in the press these days. And so it, it's obviously gone up in the agenda in terms of we, we hear regulators and governments talking about it, but I just wonder, reality on the ground, you know, are, are regulators missing a trick in a way uh, and sometimes just using it as a marketing, uh, uh, for marketing purposes? And in the same way, companies, um, again, my impression is that they're really just spending the bare minimum on some of these solutions and only if those are mandated. Um, and so, you know, again, if we really want to see movement in all of this, what, what do you think would be Um, that's interesting. So, uh, one of my business school professors recently released a paper that said that um, he, he took the, the end of ESG, um, but he's, he's actually a strong ESG proponent. So, what he really means is that ESG is moving mainstream. So, we no longer need to see it as something that's sort of unique in the sense it should be something that's just sort of built into uh, the way you analyze companies rather than looking at, this, at some sort of extra, extraordinary matrix that you have to, uh, sort of extraordinary indicator or metrics that you need to have in addition to the traditional uh, financial metrics. So it should be something that is built in if you're a long-term investor, because a lot of the ESG, um, ESG sort of components and measurements are going to take for the long term, probably not in the next year or so. So if, if you have that mindset and um, you built in those ESG measurement frameworks, as part of your, you know, the way that you view or value a company, it, I think that will be very helpful. And I think to a point it's tricky because you cannot just say that I would change sell, you know, T13 to for this value in order to, you know, to value the potential climate risk. It's, it's not that simple. So you have to look at it more holistic, holistically, using that a wide variety of um, ESG data that's collected. And I think that's where a lot of these ESG fintechs can play a role. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Th thanks, Joe. Thanks, Josh. Um, really good points on ESG. And I, I think that'll have to be a focus for 2023, for sure, for the industry and, and for us. We, we've got some things coming out later in the year that will be really interesting to look at kind of the, the benchmarking in the future of, of um, this as we, as we look forward. Um, we're just gone over an hour on this, and we've got our final trend coming up, which is probably one of the more interesting ones. And we had an intern um, that looked at this for for us uh, in the in the past 
week or so on the future of AI in financial services. So maybe we can start off with um, the, the intern who's almost like a special guest for us when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, and maybe we can, we can start out on some of the key findings that, that she found in this space. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'd like to talk about AI in financial services. AI is currently transforming the financial industry by automating tedious tasks and improving decision-making processes. For example, AI can be used for fraud detection, credit scoring, and risk management. AI is also enhancing customer experience through virtual assistants and chatbots. The development of AI in financial services is happening at a rapid pace. With advancements in machine learning and data analysis, AI is becoming more sophisticated in understanding and predicting market trends. This is leading to more efficient processes and improved outcomes for both financial institutions and their customers. As we move forward, AI is poised to play an even greater role in the financial industry. It has the potential to revolutionize the way we manage our finances and make investment decisions. To quote the philosopher Plato, necessity is the mother of invention. The need for efficiency, cost reduction, and improved decision-making in financial services has driven the development of AI, and we can expect to see even more innovative uses of AI in the future. In conclusion, the current state of AI in financial services is exciting, with a lot of potential for growth and improvement. As we embrace this technology, we can look forward to a future of more efficient and effective financial services. Thank you. Ben, I, I have to bring you in on this. I mean, it, you know, you, 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 you probably more than any of us have, have found uh, AI and, and more particularly chat GPT as, as, as being one of the more entertaining elements of, of AI at the moment. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on where we are and where we're going on this? I, I think it, it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody on the call that our intern was actually chat GPT, which may, would make our, our current intern a bit nervous about his potential future at Capron Asia. But maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about um, AI and, and yeah. what you yeah, see yeah. as being the space yeah. within this. Oh. I guess it makes me nervous about my future at Capron Asia because the uh, it, it said it, it said it basically better than I could, and I think if you put it, if anyone's played with ChatGPT, you you see you put in a sensible question and and you get a response like that. Um, just so so yeah, I mean, where to from here? It's it's uh, I guess it's a question that's not just related to finance, but but to to the everyday life more generally, whether it's Facebook and virtual reality or ChatGPT or, or whatever else it is. Um, <clears throat> specific to, to the finance industry, I, I guess arguably finance has been at the forefront of, of a lot of the innovations and a lot of the implementations of, um, of AI type uh, products or, or, or usages, um, as, as our intern mentioned, um, internal processes like credit scoring and lending, fraud and money, lend money laundering, uh, and risk management more generally, it can use data and make um, it can join. It can find insights that you wouldn't necessarily find from the human eye, uh, better and more quickly. Uh, and then, I guess we've, we've talked about digital banks and embedded finance and those sorts of things um, ad nauseum today. So that's a, a more customer-facing use case. Then, then also chatbots are starting to to work properly now. Uh, I mean, in the past, they were, they were a bit clunky. I think now they're starting to, to be a bit more um, productive. And also robo-advisors, and again, our intern mentioned that uh, didn't use the term robo-advisor, but we see a lot more robo-advisors in and for use in financial planning and financial decision-making in, in Asia, particularly companies like Stashaway and Endow Us, and, and also banks like, um, like OCBC and DBS have various uh, robo, uh, robo offerings. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the positive spin, the, on the, on the challenging side, I mean, it's not all one way traffic because you still have to have, you know, data, in, data in to make decisions. So the old adage of garbage in garbage out still rings true and none more so than for legacy banks where the, where yes, they have a, a mountain of data, but is it all in the right place that do, does anyone understand what that data means when it goes into the AI engine or can the AI engine interpret what, what that data says and then what decision is it making 
Um, and, and is it making the, the correct decision on false data, which is a false decision and, and all of the, these type of issues. So this one, um, uh, maybe for startups, it's okay, but for, for legacy banks, this is a real issue. Um, naturally, cyber attacks, if, if someone can, can attack AI, then maybe it has an even bigger impact than, than, regular, uh, than a regular cyber attack. And then also the simple case of, well, how do, we do, how do we know what the AI is doing? Can we explain it? Is it transparent about why it's making decisions? Is it perhaps, um, uh, is there some sort of inadvertent bias in, in the code or in, in the AI? Um, these sort of things, you know, so management of whichever organization will need to understand these type of things. So, so again, it's not all one-way traffic and, and there are challenges, um, challenges um, to, to overcome, but it's fun to watch. And like you say, Zen and uh, chat GPT is a whole, whole lot of fun. And if people haven't used it, um, then, then I recommend using it. Um, and yeah, I guess we, we watch this space over the, over the coming years on that one. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I, I think anybody who's watching this, if you haven't actually tried using chat GPT, you really should because it's it's pretty incredible. The um, the the impact i think for our industry and and we we say that about a lot of things right we say there's a lot of hyperbole of, of, um you know blockchain is going to change change the industry but when you start thinking about the implications and and playing around with chat gpt it, it really is clear that ai i think will will have one of the greatest impacts on this um yeah. going forward yeah i mean i guess a couple of years ago, Google uh, launched this uh, this voice automated voice um, platform where you can book a hairdresser or whatever it was using that. And we haven't seen much come from that or Google Glasses or something. But I, I, well, my experience with ChatGPT it does it does feel like it's um, you know we're on the verge of something uh, with this one, and and particularly with coding, if you're coding something, it'll um, debug your code or, or tighten up your code much much better than much more quickly, you know, than, than you can do it yourself. So all of these things. Yeah, I guess we, we yeah. watch this space. Yeah, for sure. Great, thanks, Ben, um, and thanks everyone. Uh, let me bring back all of the all of the uh, analysts uh, that participated in this back. Thanks, Ben, Gavin, Joe, Josh, for your time today and looking through this. Um, and thank you, everyone who attended today's session. We had a lot of questions in the background um, that came through. Tried to get through as many of those as we could with the questions that were asked, but <clears throat> we'll definitely reply to you. Uh, for any that we didn't get through. But uh, thank you again for attending uh, this session today. Again, it's the 13th time that we've done this. So we're really excited to continue to bring you some of the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace and, and what we'll see over the course of the rest of 2023. Uh, we had some QR codes there for how you could sign up for our newsletter if you haven't, or if you're interested in reaching out to us, please do through uh, research at Capron Asia or directly to one of us on this on LinkedIn or over email. Thank you again for your time today. We hope you found these trends valuable and look forward to continuing to bring you kind of some of the insight that we're seeing in Asia Pacific financial services. Thank you. Mm -hmm.